So good evening, everybody, and uh, I'm very honored to be the first speaker. I'm going to um, entertain you, um, share some ideas what uh, ambient intelligence is and why it might be relevant to you, and um, also provide some hands-on uh, experiences. <coughs> so why should you be listening to me and why should you be interested? Is this something... Uh, that affects your lives, or is it just theory? Um, clearly, we, you're uh, connected to the internet as everybody else around the globe nowadays, or most people. But uh, simultaneously, we find when we're connected to Facebook, Twitter, and uh, that we uh, connect to others, uh, that uh, there's a limit to uh, who we can connect to. There's a limit to the number of people uh, that we can um, maintain cognitively stable uh, relationships with a uh, scientist Dunbar calculated this to a number of 150. So in the next decade, when we're going to see that we can connect to practically anything on the planet, be it things, places, or other people, <coughs> then uh, this is going to be an overload uh, to uh, us. So what can we do? We can only then try to sort of delegate this cognitive load and uh, so make things in the ambient smarter, so hence the ambient intelligence. It's not about robots, it's about offloading ourselves and making our environment smarter. So we have to rethink ourselves how we do things. And uh, this is uh, quite similar to what happened after World War II when people were uh, computing things and processing information and then we invented computers to do it for us and now we have to invent something else, ambient intelligence uh, to do it for us. So what is this? Why? Uh, what makes this happen or makes this possible? And today we, you're connected via 4G networks, uh, so LTE, via personal devices, you see things that you can connect to the net, even drones, or you plug in your uh, equipment at home. You can control your smart home environments to the left, or you can uh, connect uh, yourself uh, to when you're out running, put sensors in your shoes, or your golf ball, or your um, toothbrush. So everything can admit uh, information. So there is no doubt about it that we have access to the information. Even your vacuum cleaner can uh, be connected to the internet. And so we can have smart homes, but it's too much to, to handle. In the infrastructure, also things are happening with connected roads. Your vehicle is uh, being connected to the internet. We have surveillance. So a lot of things are happening. And in the future, we will have much faster networks just with low latency. And uh, six things per uh, person on Earth is just a conservative estimate. So 50 billion devices, easily. In, um, in 20, by 2020. And so we will have new interaction technologies like virtual reality. We see those uh, things uh, popping up already today with wearables, vision sensing and touch. So there will be new ways to interact and we will have to rethink our society, sort of a society 4.0 just as People are talking about automation in industry, where you have industry 4.0, where you address things like urban sustainability, transport, health. So we have to address today's challenges, make this work for us to, uh, to benefit from ambient intelligence. And I'm going to talk about a health challenge. I'm not going to talk about ambient in, uh, intelligence uh, in a general sense only, also about the health challenge. As in Europe uh, already, 18% of the population is over 65, and it will be 30% by 2060. And we can't put uh, everybody, uh, provide them with a, a home with uh, professional staff, so people want to stay at home longer, with uh, actively in contact with uh, close of kin, friends, family, and also backed up by professional staff. 
So how do you do that? How do you enable them to uh, keep and maintain an active life autonomously? And this is what our project has been about. It's an EU project, and I'm going to share some, some of the insights uh, in what this project has be, uh, provided. So here we see an elderly person and um, living at home and surrounded by professional care and informal care accessed by a small panel. They can, of course, visit, but all of you already have mobile lifestyles. Think of elderly people who are in your family and you want to stay in touch with, and you want that they at home also can stay in touch with you and sh that you are aware that they are, uh, they are okay. They are, uh, they are uh, happy and uh, you don't want to have to call all the time. You just want to say, uh, be, know that they're okay. So how do you use sensors, actuators in homes uh, to, to enable them to have an active life and be aware that they are well? Where you can have things like keep track of medication, meals, things, activities, appointments, equipment, appliances in the home and also provide social communication. So if you wish to, to, uh, to get in touch, you can do so. And uh, you can guide, uh, get guidance, monitoring, fall detection, and orientation outdoors, all accessed via a small panel. Now, this is a lot to take in. So what I did is, is just uh, provide a small video, which I'm going to access now and show you what happens when, when all of this is um, uh, working. Here is an example of setting up a flooding detection sensor. The caregiver places a flooding detection sensor under the bathroom carpet. It will signal if the carpet gets too wet. Here the senior forgets to turn off the water. When the carpet gets too wet, a signal is sent to the sensor control unit, which establishes a connection using MediaSense to the Salig system. Salig alerts an informal caregiver using SMS. At the home, a jingle alerts the senior that something is wrong and can message the senior to turn off the water in the bathroom. Speaker alerts can also be used to remind the senior of, for instance, Remember to take the medicine. An important aspect of the Solig system is to be able to remind and check that the senior has taken medicine. Here is a tilt sensor. It is used to detect if the pillbox have been used at a specific period of time. The Solig system implements pose recognition and calculates a value based on the movements of the senior. At present, it can recognize eating and fall detection. Here is an example of Solig++ analyzing movements to detect the fall. Kinect units are used for pose recognition. So we saw a small video. There is a flood detection in the bathroom. I just took a sample of a few cases. Flood detection in the bathroom. There is a pillbox and there is an activity recognition. And those things are tied together. There was also something else, some glue in the system where uh, I'm going to, uh, I've shown you the movie, but there is some glue in the system. So in the home to the left, there is a flood detection, there is a pillbox at least, and there is uh, pose recognition in that you can use. And there was also something else that these notifications were automatically sent. So when the, the sink was flooded, there, there was a signal, oh, there is an alarm. So you, that can go to the next of kin but it can also go to professional care if there is a fall detected. And I think uh, this is uh, something we have to um, uh, demonstrate live. And I'm going to start the... Uh, and this is done. Uh, the um, 
my PhD student, uh, Bin Chao, and he has uh, been a very good actor in this movie, and he will also demonstrate now you in an ex excellent manner what happens, two things. One is pose recognition, and one is activity recognition, and these are very complicated things to detect, and please, So there's a fall down on the left. And now he's eating. And there's a delay. And now the eating is detected. And uh, you see that there is, beside his image, what the, this little box detects and the image processing uh, is uh, then um, sent uh, to a processing unit, an algorithm to detect this. So, th and there is uh, an, uh, an, uh, something very powerful working. So thank you very much, and uh, excellent. <laughs> yes, uh, great. Uh, just quickly about this system, all these things are then connected wherever they are, via blue cloud, uh, in your home, in the informal care, the formal care, and also with the care system. So you can uh, bind things together. Moreover, there are uh, relations across the internet between everything. Remember me talking about relations earlier? So instead of uh, relations where you have to uh, you're only limited to 150 uh, stable relations. This is offloaded to a sort of a blue cloud, and then in the yellow part, you have uh, functions operating on this. So the decision support, should we notify somebody? Uh, should we invoke video? Um, do we um, uh, send uh, notifications about medication or a calendar? All these things are then... Um, operating in all these relations. So this is a very powerful idea. And it becomes even more powerful when you can detect via, uh, via sensors um, things like pose recognition. So via the biometrics on the left, you can uh, detect how you're walking. So you can recognize who is in the apartment, if there are strangers in the apartment, if somebody has been falling. So all these things are possible. And these, um, so when you get a notification, it is not the video that you send today. It is uh, a fact that you're interested in. So also the privacy is uh, then respected. On the right, you see a much more complicated model generated by the Kinect camera where you um, detect subtle activities such as eating, drinking, and social interaction. Um, so this is uh, very uh, powerful and it becomes even more powerful uh, since we can combine things. Remember the pillbox you saw where the tilt sensor at the beginning then you can combine it with the, uh, the filming sequence uh, that you just saw. And then the pill box is opened, but you're never sure whether the medicine has been taken. But if you combine it with the activity recognition, then you can draw the conclusion, yes, I've, I've taken my pill, because there is evidence. The camera has seen it, the image analysis, and the opening of the pill box is then uh, proof. So you can do very clever things in the, um, in the ambience. You don't have to ask the pillbox. You don't have to ask the camera. They together cooperate in order to, uh, to really determine that everything is OK at home. So to conclude then, uh, I think uh, what I've just shown you in this uh, short presentation is that there are uh, considerable uh, benefits to, uh, to this approach to push intelligence into the ambience, to uh, give uh, technology, uh, take advantage of uh, technology advances to, um, uh, to anticipate our needs and uh, to make smart decisions on our behalf and offload our cognitive limitations and 
uh, as we've seen in this project, now elderly and uh, next of kin, uh, friends and family can just uh, use this to stay in touch and uh, let this, uh, this technology then um, enable us to stay in touch and be, uh, enable well-being. So similarly, uh, there are applications in industry, transport, um, automatic transport, you're already using things like ways today or, or just uh, travel uh, guidance. Uh, we need to address the challenges of sustainability, other health challenges. I haven't even talked about how you can use this to uh, do predictive analysis because if you analyze the gate via this image analysis, then you can see, well, is somebody developing hip problem? If you have uh, data about one elderly and you have the data of uh, this whole population, then you can see if somebody is deviant, if somebody is developing a problem, and you can also see how they're responding to their medicine. So there are all kinds of benefits we can see, but then we need to wor work on the enabling technologies. And uh, we can take an advantage of interaction technologies. We've just seen one example. Uh, we take advantage of technology um, uh, developments in Internet of Things. When we, at the uh, second slide, I showed you how we can connect, uh, connect everything via low-cost electronics and low-cost communication. There is cloud. There is big data. Big data, the access of... Um, a population such as this uh, community of elderly where you compare people and see patterns that are important to attend to. But then all of this is fine, but it changes just as a hammer changes uh, one, uh, one instance in history and when we invented an axe, it just changes our humans because now we have a powerful tool. So what about this social contract of ours? Because in society, we don't see it, but there's a social contract between what we uh, expect from others and from government. And uh, so what about interaction? What, how do we interact with smart homes? How, what do we accept? Uh, how do we feel about integrity and privacy? Where is our data? Do we feel comfortable when there is a camera in the home? So there are all kinds of things that need to be studied, even if there are enormous benefits. And what about automation? Does it affect jobs? And also, how do we feel about government? Who is really uh, in charge here? How do we uh, see about uh, view upon responsibility? So I think there are lots of things that uh, um, you, all of you need to help study. And with this, I thank you for your listening to this talk.